Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Maurizio Cecconi. I'm the head of anesthesia and intensive care at Humanitas Research Hospital in Milan. I am the president of the European Society of Intensive Care uh, Medicine. So welcome. And uh, today, the 30 minutes with is 30 minutes with uh, Professor Flavia Machado. Hello, Flavia. Hello, hello Maurizio. Thank you for inviting uh, before we me. Start, uh, thank you for being with us, Flavia. And before we start, uh, Flavia is really one of the legends in intensive care. She does not need uh, many introductions, but I would like just to share some of her uh, bio and some of her achievements. She's a professor of intensive care at the Federal University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where she's the head of the intensive care section of the anesthesiology pain and intensive care department. She has trained in internal medicine, infectious disease, and critical care, and has become a leading expert in sepsis. She's one of the founders and now the CEO of the Latin Sepsis American Institute, LASI, having been its president. Uh, LASI is devoted to awareness raising, quality improvement, and the coordination of multi-center studies in the field of sepsis. She's part of the executive board of the Global Sepsis Alliance and the executive committee for the World Sepsis Days, she has served on, bo on the board of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, International Guidelines, and the International Sepsis Forums since 2014. She's also a member of the Executive and Scientific Committee of the Brazilian Research in Intensive Care Network, BRICNET. We will definitely talk about this later. She's also the Editor-in-Chief of the Official Journal of the Brazilian Critical Care Association and the Protocols Critical Care Association. She has more than 230 research works, uh, nearly 20,000 citations. She's been involved in the executive and steering committees of codex randomized clinical trials to determine whether intravenous dexamethasone increases the number of ventilator-free days in patients with COVID-19 associated ARDS. Uh, Flavia, this is just some of the few things uh, uh, that you've done and you have achieved and, and it's great to have you with us today because I really think you, you are an inspirational figure for uh, many of us, certainly for me, but I know also for many trainees and, and many people going into intensive care. You're a clinician, you, you are a researcher. Let me ask you the first question. Um, the contribution that Brazil has brought uh, to the fight of COVID has been extraordinary. And what I keep repeating to everyone during the last 15 months, it's not just what you do during the pandemic, but how well prepared you were before this. And certainly establishing one of the most successful research networks in the world in critical care was a key for many of the trials and research that we've seen coming out from Brazil and really helping everywhere in the world. How did you manage to set up this successful network, Flavia? Well, uh, thank you for all you have said, Mauricio. And uh, yeah, I agree with you that BrickNet uh, has a key role because uh, we uh, we are a network in a middle-income country, and uh, we all know how important it is to have research contributions from our settings. And I think that the su success from BrickNet has many reasons, but certainly one of them is that we haven't seen in a meeting room to discuss how we're going to build a successful uh, research network. It, 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 it didn't happen like that. We were friends. We started from the beginning uh, discussing among friends. We were doing small research together. Uh, we had our partnership, our small partnerships. And uh, we have fun together. We sit at the bar drinking beers together. And then uh, some of us founded the BrickNet in 2009. And then on 2014, we went to a wonderful beach in Rio de Janeiro. And we sit down in a meeting room, room but together with our families on that inspiring place. And we decided that we had to go bigger and we had to play uh, on the big game. And uh, I think that one thing is this, we were partners already, we were friends, we decided to work together even, even more. And the second thing is that all the Brazilian ICUs were in a very good moment. We were, uh, all of us were willing to do research. 
our research, to be proud of what we were able to do. And together with this, we also had the chance to have grants coming from different, different parts, uh, including our government. So I think it was a, a mix of things and we are friends so we could discuss the rules uh, from which we were working together. So, and then BrickNet was just starting to work and it is still doing good things uh, until now and we are planning to do uh, even more good things together. Well, you, you certainly are doing a lot of good things, um, but if you're starting with, uh, with friends, it's certainly more fun to do things. Yes. Do you have any anecdotes from the beginning of uh, this with friends or something that remind you about the beginning of BrickNet? Yeah, I'm not, not sure that it's an anecdote, but uh, I remember well uh, a situation when we were planning our first big trial, which was the checklist ICU, that it's in JAMA, it's our first JAMA. And for us, it was a big, big challenge that it was a cluster randomizer trial, and we were all wow, doing all this. And then our friends from ENZIX, Naomi uh, Raymond and Simon Pfeiffer asked us to uh, take part on fluid trips. It was a, uh, a survey, a one day survey on uh, how we, you, we use fluids in the ICU. And so we said, oh my gosh, we are not going to do this. We are not able, we are so busy doing the checklist. Uh, and then we said no to them. And then I received the, uh, an email from Simon saying, oh, what a shame, Fabian. And then we sat on the scientific committee of BritNet. We are around 15 people there and said, oh, we are here, we are 20 ICUs. Let's do this. Simon, 20 ICUs are gonna be okay? And Simon said, of course, let's go. And then, okay, then we sent one single email for uh, the mailing of BritNet at that time to our friends. And then we start to receive yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. And they send a second email. And we end up with more than 200 Brazilian ICUs willing to take part on that study. And then we had a problem because we have to arrange everything. We have to arrange the red cap. We have to arrange the training, all the that ICUs. And we are doing the checklist ICU trial when we have to arrange all that. When we end up being the biggest country on the fluid trip. And uh, it was our first partnership with Enzex. It was a great success. And the people in Brazil were so proud of doing that, that I think this was one of the most, uh, uh, one, one of the key things that make Britneck very proud. And uh, it was a good start. And then we had the JAMA on the checklist. And uh, yes, and then every, everybody was willing to collaborate in the next studies. Uh, of BrickNet, so I, it was I, fine. And I think that shows that having a network and an established network, it's, it's amazing how many resources you may pull more than sometimes what you think. But that's also yes. very interesting. Uh, yes, because we did, we did fluids, Mauricio, without any money at all, a 200. Uh, okay, it's a one day survey study, but we had no money at all, no support. Sorry, go ahead. I was, I, was, I was going to say that the it also shows that, uh, especially for what comes to the field of intensive care, even if it is in low and middle income countries, if you have a strong research network, strong methodology, uh, a lot of these studies and trials, especially, they're very applicable also in high income countries. So I think that's a common thing in intensive care because certainly some of the results that we got from uh, from you guys in brazil that really helped a lot in uh, into into other countries as well we certainly seen this in europe for instance um that leads me to the to the next question is that you've traveled the world before covid at least you've seen uh, many intensive cares uh, around the world is there a, a difference between uh, intensive care in low and middle income countries intensive care in high income countries, is there a difference in this, in the way we care for patients or, and if there is a difference, which one is it? Well, Mauricio, this is a tricky question. And actually, um, 
trying to escape from uh, this uh, stereotypes, I would say that I, I don't need to travel all around the world to see this. Uh, I think that I just have to walk around in Sao Paulo to see this. Let's, let's try to explain what I mean. You talk about high income countries and low and middle income countries, and I see use in rich countries and in poor countries. And uh, I live in the biggest city of Latin America when we have the most and nicest and fanciest hospitals in the country and in South America. And I can assure you that some of our nicest hospitals are much better than the vast majority of uh, middle hospitals in many, many high income countries. And by contrary, I can look at my city and see even in the richest city of the country, I can see some hospitals, public or private, that are not good. So I think that we cannot, uh, uh, stereo we cannot give this stereotype, a high income countries, and I'm talking more about middle income countries, because of course, when you talk about ICUs in low income countries, we have a different phenotype of ICUs when you have ICUs. But yes, they are different. They are different in many ways. And I prefer to talk inside my, my own city. I think that when you are in a typical uh, public ICU in Brazil, which means a typical middle income country public ICU, we can face uh, more resource limitations. And uh, we face almost every day the dilemma of shortage of ICU beds, which means the dilemma to decide which patient are gonna come to our ICUs. And uh, this is not something that you have in high income countries or that we have in the most, uh, most of the private uh, ICUs in my city. So uh, it's different. And there is another differences. I think that we in uh, the good public ICUs, we developed a sort of teamwork because we work in a more stressful, stressful environment. And uh, when you talk about uh, private ICUs as a general, uh, maybe the situations are more easygoing. So we work in a less stressful way. But on the other hand, maybe the patients that you are seeing in a private ICU and in many high income countries are not uh, really critically ill patients at least the percentage of the patients that uh, are critically ill, it will depend on the, uh, uh, on the availability of ICU beds. So I would say that the major differences are this. Uh, try not to skip from this stereotype because you have good public ICUs that have no limitation of resource and you have bad private ICUs where there is no critical ill patients and you have problems with teams. So I, I, I would better skip the stereotypes, but uh, the characteristics is, is usually the shortage of resources, uh, the limitation of ICU beds and a more stressful environment in the public ICUs or in the middle income countries, if you want to say that. But I think you, you, you raise a very valid point. I agree with you. We have to be aware that there is a lot of heterogeneity in, uh, in intensive care in each country. So, uh, and indeed, I don't like this uh, dichotomous classification. I think it's more about the resources that you have and, and also how you use those resources. And it, it, it leads me to another question. I remember reading one of your editorials even before COVID about uh, limited resources and deciding what to do. Uh, when you don't have the number of ICU beds that you would like. Uh, for me, the first time in my life where a situation that was similar to this was exactly with COVID. Uh, before that, I didn't have uh, any problems with uh, limited resources. I always had plenty. And this time, it was very, very different. Uh, you know, I don't have to explain you what happened. You and I, we spoke on the phone during the first days of the outbreak, even in Lombardy. I was asking you, what uh, what you were doing in situations like that. We discuss a lot uh, uh, on this, and I think it is uh, 
uh, a very important learning point from uh, all of us in uh, all parts of the world that a situation like this can really disrupt the way we work and we all can be faced to work in a limited resource settings for, for whatever reasons. Uh, did it make it easier for you to be used to, to make those decisions to, to work in that way, in a way when the pandemic came? You think, did you find it that uh, it was something that you brought from the past to the, to the some learnings that you brought to the pandemic? I, I'm interested to know how your experience was. Yeah, in a way, yes. I think it make it, it it was easier because we are already used to that. So for us, it was uh, more uh, easier to uh, to get on uh, our contingency plans for resource limitations. Uh, the stress that use contingency plans for, for instance, for the lack of sedatives or neuromuscular blockages or uh, it was the stress that this gave to the team was less, uh, I would believe, than if you were in an ICU where you never uh, uh, miss things. So uh, in a way, it was easier. And in the sec and talking about the shortage of ICUs, you were more or less right because it's never easy. So it's never easy. So we are used to deal with lines to the ICUs, but the lines that we had uh, in, some, in some periods of the COVID uh, uh, were very stressful. So maybe maybe this, it was easy, but from the other point of view, uh, it is not good, Mauricio, because even if it were used to this, uh, what we saw in some periods of the pandemic, uh, it was uh, it was uh, above all the expectations. So even for us that are very used to this, it was very hard. And uh, it, in Sao Paulo, for instance, on March, uh, we have lines for COVID patients even in the best private hospitals. So it was the completely calls. We have a, a, a period on Sao Paulo that the private hospitals were asking for beds in the public hospitals, the completely uh, opposite uh, direction that we are used to. So I think that uh, although we were better prepared and uh, the way that we lived usually uh, prepared us for this, some periods were very, very difficult, very hard. Yeah, and it was very difficult for our teams, especially uh, when this uh, was clear that it was not a sprint, but it was a marathon and we started to have second wave and third wave and everyone was tired. Uh, you are one of uh, the recognized leaders in our field. What makes a great uh, ICU team, Plaga? This is one of the questions that we're getting from, uh, uh, from our uh, platform is, uh, what makes an ICU a very good ICU in terms of uh, people and team? I think that uh, uh, the, the secret for us, at least, I think that the most important thing that we have here in our ICU is that the most important thing for us is the multidisciplinary approach to the patient, serially, serially taken, which means we doctors may lead this team, but we have to listen everyone. And sometimes you are not the leaders and we have to recognize this. So we have the profound respect for our multidisciplinary team. The second important thing to have a good team is, uh, so the first one is to listen, to listen to the people. And the second one for me is to listen. You have to have communication things. So we have to communicate. And the third, we have to forgive. We have to understand that if something went wrong, it's not because I don't want you to know or that I want to uh, shit on you. It's because I just forget to tell you. Forgive me, it was, it was not my intention. I did it, but by mistake. So uh, listen to everyone, uh, keep your communication channels uh, all open and forgive if somebody makes a mistake. Nobody's doing this uh, with bad intentions. So I think that we do this very nicely here. We have a wonderful team. 
and everybody listen to the other one. I, th I, th I think it's a very important point. Sometimes this is referred as a psychological safety climate. And then that's exactly I think what you're describing there. So I, I completely agree with you on that. Uh, let me move to another uh, topic. You, you are famous now for trials, but you are also an expert on physiology, an expert in the field of sepsis. There seem to me a little bit of tension sometimes between studies on physiology and studies on, uh, on and trials in intensive care. Do you perceive this tension and uh, how do you deal with this tension? Well, I think that everyone that uh, listened to our meetings in Congress perceived this tension, yes. And, um, and uh, I, I always say that uh, physiology is unrefutable. Physiology is physiology. And if you're showing something in the physiology, uh, it is true. The problem is just the variability of the human being. So when you show something on the physiology, on the lab, or even on humans in the ICU, uh, the variability of uh, us, of our patients, maybe we'll turn this uh, and uh, it will not reproduce. So we should be able to do physiology studies with a proper sample size. That's the problem. So physiology studies have never enough sample size to deal with the variability of the human being. So we need to have the physiology background, the plausibility, the, it's called the physiolog physiological plausibility, but we need to prove that this will work in the vast majority of the patients. And to do this, we need to have clinical trials and uh, outcomes, clinical outcomes. So I don't see that there's any problem and any uh, opposition on these two fields. We need to have strong physiological studies. We need to work in a way that we will be able to produce physiological studies with a bigger sample size so we can, they can guide us to clinical trials in a better way. So sounds good, but it's very difficult to do. I, I would like to elaborate a little bit on this. Last week, I asked Luciano a similar question in the, in the sense that uh, I think you described well the, the pros and cons of these studies. Uh, on the other hand, on a trial, we assume that uh, you know, the intervention will be basically testing in a very homogeneous population. But the reality, we know that there are a lot of physiological phenotypes in our patients. Um, we've seen adaptive trials coming in this pandemic. They've been uh, so uh, important to give a fast knowledge to be applicable at the bedside. I've not seen yet uh, the, the use of phenotypes, maybe from large data sets, to identify maybe a slightly different intervention for a patient compared to other in the same trial. Is this something that you are now working on with uh, artificial intelligence and data science in Brazil? Is it uh, the new future for trials in the, in the coming years? What do you think? I fully agree with you, Mauricio. This is the limitation of our clinical trials and we all know, we all know about this. And yes, I agree that in the future, we will need to uh, know better about the phenotypes of our patients. So the limitations that we have about the sample size in the physiology are exactly the same limitations that we have in the clinical trial. So both needs to improve. And you're right, we need to have some kind of enrichment in our clinical trials that will come probably I'm not, I'm not sure about uh, machine learning or inter artificial intelligence or how we will reach what we need. And certainly it is to define the intervention according to the phenotype of the patient. But how we will achieve this, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that's only adaptive designs are gonna lead us to this, but it's a way to go. And it's, it, it's, we, we need to, to keep searching for the continuous improvement, both at the physiological side, uh, sites and at the clinical trials. They are both not perfect and they are complementary. They, they are not opposite one to the, to the other. 
Very good. We still have a few minutes uh, left. I would like to bring us back to something more grounded and less philosophical. When we have guidelines for sepsis and uh, recommendations, what's the best way to apply them in, uh, at the bedside? And, uh, and do you think you are part of the surviving sepsis campaign? Do you think that the same guidelines can be applicable in different parts of the world? Right, again, it's a difficult question. Uh, we are launching uh, in the next months the new uh, 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 surviving sepsis guidelines, and we tried uh, and a continuous improvement. We have already tried this on the last version to have more representation from low and middle income countries. This version is better on this. But again, the guidelines per se, they have to be based on evidence. And unfortunately, the evidence mostly comes from high income countries. So what we need first is to have more evidence coming from low and middle income countries. Then we will build up a guideline with evidence coming from these settings. This is the first step that we have, we will, it will take years to build. So the second problem is, okay, I have a guideline that was constructed based on evidence coming from settings that are different from where they're gonna be applied. So how can I, how can I adapt? So sometimes it's just impossible. For instance, no, no, uh, polymyxin membranes. It will never be applied in the vast majority of the ICUs in very uh, resource limited settings, yeah? But uh, there are some, some things that can be adapted. Uh, all the things from antibiotics, from the initial resuscitation, from which we including, we do have evidence from the from low income countries. So I think that we need to, to work on the implementation science. And for this, maybe the key thing is to build up partnerships with the local societies of with the local alliances. So we do have this African Sepsis Alliance, which is on the board of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. We have Sep uh, uh, Asian Pacific Sepsis Alliance. We have the Latin American Sepsis Institute. So we do have on the board of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, the three major alliances that are linked to resource limited settings. So maybe the people there on the board can work on instruments that can adapt this uh, to the settings. It's completely feasible, I think, but it will take partnership with the people that are really on the settings and not, not forget to construct research networks that will build evidence uh, with our research questions and our research answers. Thank you, Flavia. And that was going to be actually my, my follow-up question. What would be the priority now on research and what to do in the surviving sepsis campaign? But you already answered that. And, and I would like also to say that Flavia is now uh, for the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, also one of the steering group members of the surviving sepsis campaign. And we're very proud of that because she can bring her insight exactly now to, to move the campaign uh, forward. Uh, Flavia, we're coming nearly to the end of our uh, time together. I'm going to, uh, to ask you basically to, to conclude by saying something to a young trainee that is considering intensive care medicine as a career. Is it a good choice? What would you tell to this person? Come and join us. Be an intensivist. It is a wonderful profession. You will uh, cry because you suffer with your patients and with your families, uh, but we will learn how to work with wonderful people. Uh, I will always uh, tell the students in my university, uh, they, they are here when they are in the second uh, year of the medical school. I always tell them, uh, you will see for the first time the multidisciplinarity uh, running free and, in a, and uh, globally on intensive care. So it's a wonderful environment. We are saving lives. That's also true. But we are doing this uh, in uh, showing people how to work in a team. And, uh, and we are happy. We are very happy people. We suffer a lot, but we are happy.
come and join us. Be an intensivist. You're going to be a good, you go, it's a very good profession. Follow us. It's the best profession in the world. And with this, ladies and yes. gentlemen, I would like to thank uh, Professor Fabio Machado for being with us today. It's been wonderful to have you with us. And uh, thank you everyone for staying with us. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mauricio. Bye-bye. <laughs>